Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another installment of Art Finell Reports. I'm Art Finell. Tonight, we have a profile report on a Renaissance man, a man who has managed to transform himself time and time again, from growing up on a farm in the Midwest to becoming a professional football player to author and publisher. In fact, listen to this excerpt from his book entitled An Improbable Journey. He writes, unless you are the most arduous of football fans, you will not remember my name, although I was a member of three championship professional football teams. But for some reason, I was never quite able to escape the cloak of anonymity. Well, the cloak is off tonight for Ken Dunnick. He's here to talk about his improbable journey and his new magazine called Jersey Man. Now, the magazine features lifestyles, personalities, and trends of men throughout the Garden State of New Jersey, and it's a very interesting magazine. We're going to find out all about Mr. Ken Dunnick. Ken, welcome to the program. Great to be here. Thanks. Um, that's an interesting quote in your book. Unless you're the arduous, most arduous of football fans, you are not going to remember my name. Do you feel like you've had, you've had that kind of life to this point where people couldn't remember who you were? Well, you know, it's interesting. I've always considered myself an ordinary guy who's tried to do extraordinary things and uh, did not have superstar statistics when it came to football. However, I did think I did some incredible things, especially considering my background. So, uh, wrote the book and the quote stands for what it is. Well, let's talk, let's, let's just go through the progression here and let's start with your, your, your football career. You said you grew up in the Midwest, I think outside of Chicago. I did. Um, and decided that, hey, I'm a pretty good athlete. I want to play football. Yeah. So you were tight end. Um, and, and at some point, you, you didn't play high school, though, did I you? I did not play high school football. I was a high school basketball player. Actually, my high school coach, who was one of the great influences on my life, convinced me, uh, because I was so good at basketball, not to play football. Really? So I did not play football in high school and had a pretty successful basketball career, albeit it was in a small uh, farm community where we didn't get a lot of uh, attention from college scouts. So I wrote 200 letters in between my junior and senior year trying to get recognized. I had a great senior year and actually wound up getting a, a scholarship for basketball. Well, well, you got a scholarship for basketball, but you went on to play professional football, right. and you, you, you talk about how that came to be. Um, and folks, look at his face here now. This was a member of the, the championship Philadelphia Eagles football team uh, in 1980. You know, they, they were the NFC, it, NFC champions, and there he is, number 86, the tight end right there, breaking through the line. And uh, did you score on this play, Ken? I think, you know? I think I was running down on a kickoff or kickoff return on that play, but it's rare footage of me actually in an Eagles game. I'm glad you <laughs> captured that. <laughs> um, so you played for the Philadelphia Eagles. I did. What was that like for you? You know, it was incredible. I uh, had three offers coming out of college. I went to Memphis State University, and it's an interesting story of how I even made the transition to football in college. But I had three offers uh, from the Saints, the Rams, and the Eagles. And this is the honest to God truth. I actually chose the Eagles because I thought it would look better to be cut from the best team at that time, <laughs> which was the Eagles. But, you know, as fate would have this it. This is Dick Vermeil. This is Dick Vermeil. And uh, as fate would have it, you know, a lot of times life is fickle. And it's a question of being in the right place at the right time. And <clears throat> I went to camp, and uh, Keith Crefley and John Spagnola were the, the first two tight ends, and they both got hurt in training camp. So I got to start a couple preseason games, and I played pretty well enough for – Dick Vermeil to say, hey, we want to keep this guy around and take a look at him. All right, so it worked out for you. You, um, you were a member of the um, team. It was a good team. As you say, you might as well be cut by the best team. Huh? We, we really were the best team in the league. We had beaten who, uh, the Oakland Raiders uh, a few weeks prior to that. The Raiders eventually beat us in the Super Bowl, but uh, – I'm convinced that the 1980 Philadelphia Eagles were the best team in, uh, in football. Ron Jaworski would agree with you, a mutual friend of ours here. Um, so you played for the Philadelphia Eagles, mm -hmm. played on that championship team. You played for some other teams as well. You went on to the USFL, which at that time was booming. Well, what was that like for you? Well, I bounced around. I, I had a, a stint with the Colts and the Giants uh, back in 82. And then when the league formed, the USFL formed in 1983, I actually signed with them and played three seasons for what I think was one of the best teams that no one will remember, the Philadelphia Stars. Yeah, you tell a story in your book, and I'm going to get to the book in just a minute.
minute uh, because you have all of these personal encounters with celebrities. But I want you to tell briefly your encounter as you were you were called by the New York football giants to right. come to their camp right. because they may have a, a need for you. Right. Tell us about that need they well, had for you with the Giants. I had played in the Hall of Fame game for the Colts in 82 and then uh, I was not happy with Frank Cush and the regime there so I actually walked out of camp. I was picked up on waivers by the New York Giants and which was several weeks into preseason. Well uh, so be it the uh, my car pulled up ex exactly the same time as Lawrence Taylor who was holding out for a better contract at that time so uh -huh. uh, Ray Perkins whistled us into the field and uh, we did the nutcracker drill one on one with no running back and it dawned on me very early in my Giants career that I was Lawrence Taylor's punishment for but, showing up late. But, but but hang on, Lawrence Taylor was was holding out. He was angry with the Giants. Yeah. They weren't too happy with him. Right. So he had something to prove, and you were basically his his tackling dummy. Pretty much to, to work out his anger. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Early on in that drill, I realized what was going on, and we kind of winked at each other, and we took it a little bit easy the last 15 minutes. Yeah. What kind of car were you driving back then? I was driving an old Chrysler Cordoba, I think, and with I the Corinthian yeah, leather. With the Corinthian leather. I don't know what he was driving but it was a lot nicer than a Cordova. <laughs> <laughs> so you bounced around from a few teams right. and, um, and, 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 and then you decided finally that uh, you'd had enough and got out of the game. Well, yeah, in 1985 the USFL played their last game. In 1986 they sued the NFL and actually won an antitrust case against the league but were only or, uh, awarded three dollars in damages. So mm. uh, they had actually paid me to not join the NFL in 86 in case the league came back. And in 1987, when the league finally folded, the NFL minimum in 1987 was $65,000. I was making far more than that with the Stars, and I was offered a contract for league minimum. I just didn't want to go back to that uh, pay sure. range. I had just turned 30. It was relatively healthy, and for me, it was just a good time. Well, to guys, out. the guys today spend that amount of money on lunch. Uh, well, it's tip, with, it's with, tip with money the, That's tip money yeah. now. But there were some good players in the USFL. Herschel Walker oh. played there. Warren Moon. I mean, uh, uh, gosh, the list goes on. And me, Doug Flutie. There's yeah. too way too many to name. But then there was this other guy that was pretty good too. We have a clip of some video here. Let's play this video, and uh, let's see if we recognize this guy. There he go. He drops back to pass. Yeah. There goes the pass, and it is caught yeah. for a touchdown in the end zone by Ken Dunnick. And again, more rare footage. I'll tell you, that was in an exhibition game after the 1984 season in London. By the way, we had just won the USFL championship in 84. The following week, they had arranged to play this exhibition game. Now, you can imagine playing uh, two or three exhibition games, an 18-game regular season, three playoff games, and then going to play an exhibition sure, game. It, sure. it was crazy, but it was a great experience for us to get to uh, experience London and, of course, uh, the stars were a special group of well, I, being around each I, other. I, I liked your swagger after you caught it. It was like, no big deal. That's false man. bravado. That's the definition this. of false bravado. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's talk about post-football. As you say, the NFL, uh, the, the, the USFL um, had its heyday, then moved out. And by that time, you know, you were, uh, were getting towards the end of your playing career. Mm -hmm. You knew that... Um, you needed to segue into your next thing. You bounced around for a while, didn't you? I did. Um, you know, uh, the transition from pro football, where uh, everyone wants you, you're uh, very popular, into business is difficult, especially back then, because we didn't make a whole heck of a lot of money during our playing days. The guys now make so much money if they're smart, they never have to work again. So, you know, I went into a sales position with a local paper company, and uh, now you go from really uh, people wanting to talk with you to knocking on doors and having trouble getting an audience yeah. with your potential customers. Yeah. So it can be a tough transition. What, what I did was I used my competitive spirit that I used in sports all those years and just kind of transitioned it to making now my game was going to be uh, the competitiveness of sales and uh, I was able to make that transition. Well I mean, obviously you did it well and another transition you made is that um, you're an author. Uh, this is your book we have here. We have it in uh, post-production. An Improbable Journey, uh, Kenneth R. Dunnick. And in this book, you, you, you give little episodes in your life where you have close encounters with celebrities. As you say, you were the no-name, but, right. uh, but these were big, big-name stars. Um, what did you hope to accomplish by writing this? It's, it's a good read, by the way. I appreciate that. You know, uh, as I talk about in the book, I, you know, I consider myself kind of a modern-day Forrest Gump. I mean, I had all these interactions with all these incredibly uh, popular and interesting people. But um, 
In 2008, uh, my wife was critically injured in a car accident, and I found it cathartic to write. And I had all, I'd done some public speaking. I had uh, you know, talked about all these interesting people I met. People recommended that I write a book. So for me, during that time when she was in the hospital, it was cathartic for me just to sit at the computer and write and uh, put together a manuscript, and it was uh, picked up by a publisher. And yeah. it's just a bunch of short stories about you know, the people I've had the pleasure of meeting, Michael Jordan, Mike Tyson, Don Rickles, uh, all sorts of different characters. Let's talk about Michael Jordan just for a second because you were friends with Doug Collins. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys used to play hoops together when he was still in his playing days. Back, and, and back, so you, 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 back in the uh, Eagles training camp. Yeah, and, 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 and so uh, post that, he's now coaching the Chicago Bulls. Right. And uh, you say, hey, there's my old buddy Doug, and he's got a star player on the team named yeah. Michael Jordan. Well, but at the end of the conversation, something's not quite right. Yeah, Tell us what happened. Didn't go very well. Well, uh, I'm from Chicago, and of course, uh, you know, Michael Jordan was an icon of mine. I worked for Roosevelt Paper Company back then, who was owned by Irv Kosloff, who used to own the 76ers, who subsequently sold the team to Fitz Dixon. But he had the four seats on the visiting bench. So uh, Doug recognized me, called me over. We were talking with, you know, with our, uh, Kaz and I, with our wives and with Doug. And he said, would you like to meet Michael Jordan? I said, well, of course. So you know, Doug was a bit of a prankster back then. So he calls Michael over. And of course, I'm very honored to shake his hand. And in the middle of the handshake, Doug goes, Ken, I'd like you to meet a or uh, Michael, I'd like you to meet a friend of mine, Ken Dunnick. And by the way, he says he can kick your ass. Yeah, yeah. And Michael Jordan was in pregame mode, and he didn't appreciate that. And he says, tell Ken he can't kick my ass in anything, and turns and walks away. And I was standing there meeting him. And he didn't most look happy about no, it. No, no, he wasn't happy. He had his game face on. I don't blame him. So Doug, and I said to Doug, why did you say that? And he said, yeah, he didn't like that too much, did he? So the meeting my uh, my childhood idol uh, was uh, didn't turn out the way I Yeah, well, again, uh, all those anecdotes are in here. Um, and some of them are quite funny, if I say so myself. Uh, um, you know, with your, your close encounters with Johnny Unitas and, and, and Don Rickles, as you mentioned, who, who you write in the book, and you're a big guy. Don Rickles is not a, a big guy, right. but that he was trying to hit on your wife right in front of you. A little bit, yeah. We were in the dressing room after his show, and uh, he had had, I think, one scotch or two too many at that point. And he was uh, commenting about my wife, how she looked like Beverly Sassoon at the time. And... Uh, Don got to the point where I had to usher my wife out of the room and, yeah. uh, and cut it Before short. Before I have to, to, to cut this, what, what was yes. this town, the, the hockey puck? Yeah. That was Don Rubles, yeah, right? Yes. Yeah. Shoot him uh, like a hockey puck. Um, um, so you wrote the book. Mm -hmm. um, what was that like? How did you know you could do this? Because you've always had a propensity for writing, haven't you? I was a broadcast journalism major in college, and uh, after my pro football career, I had had a family. As a matter of fact, I had triplet daughters in 1989, so I had to put all my journalistic goals on the back burner in order to make as much money as I could to uh, to support my family. But I had always uh, had a, a, a hope that I could continue in journalism, and I had the opportunity to write the book, and I've done some some TV and radio over the years, and. Uh, for me, it was like uh, just a great opportunity to get back into what I really love. You've do. also done some documentary work, and you've dabbled quite a bit in media. We're going to get to the magazine in a moment, mm -hmm. but 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 media has been your thing post your career. Yeah, we have it? two uh, projects. Uh, one is a film documentary on the Philadelphia Stars titled The Team That Time Forgot. Several major sports networks are looking at it now. The, the Philadelphia Baltimore Stars still hold the best three-year record in the history of pro football, 48-13-1. Still hold the record for the most wins in a single season of 19. And again, as you mentioned before, we didn't do it against the Little Sisters of the Poor. We did it against Reggie White and Steve Young and yeah. Herschel Walker and some of the best players that ever played the game. So it was a special team. It was too good to be forgotten. So I've spent the last 30 years preaching, and we finally have this project off the ground and hope to have a major announcement. Well, again, folks, look at his face. He was on three championship teams, and he says, nobody knows who I am. <laughs> but this is Mr. Ken Dunnick. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about this, because uh, this is your new project, um, the Jersey Man magazine. We're going to find out what that's all about and uh, what your thinking was going into that. And, um, hey, there's a guy we know, Mob Scene with George Anastasia. You're talking, um, we're talking with Ken Dunnick. This is Art Fennell Reports on the Comcast Network. We'll be right back. Philadelphia Stars and the NFL and the USFL. Currently, 
publisher of the magazine Jersey Man. He's also the author uh, of the book, An Improbable Journey. This is a renaissance man. He does uh, quite a few things. Uh, welcome back to the program, including, as we were saying, going to the break, documentary work. You've, mm -hmm. you've done some documentary work already. And you've got another one in the works with Sam Mills? We have a feature film in development written by Tim Chambers. You might remember Tim wrote the Immaculata Women's Basketball movie, mm -hmm. and uh, it's called Field Mouse. Sam Mills was five foot nine, 225 pounds, and nobody wanted him. He was the best player pound for pound I ever saw. He went on to become a five-time All-Pro with the Saints and the Panthers and died tragically a few years ago of pancreatic cancer. Yes. So we developed a film project around Sam titled Field Mouse and uh, have some studios interested and hope to have some good news. Good, on that good, good. Well. We wish you all yeah, the best in that. And we remember Sam Mills from his playing days. And I think he was coaching for the Panthers at the end. Was yeah. he coaching? He was coaching. Not yeah. only was Sam Mills the best player pound for pound I ever saw, but he was one of the greatest people I ever yeah. met. And it's, it's the right thing to try to. Uh, and there's a statue of him outside of Carolina State. Did not know so, that. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Well, let's talk about. The Jersey Man uh, magazine. This is your current edition. It is uh, quite, right quite a popular cover. As I, you, as I, you I, I, I can see that. Yeah. Um, in fact, you know, get this cover again right here. We're looking at it. Um, and you've got this is like your swimsuit edition. Only in New Jersey this time of year, they're not mm -hmm. wearing swimsuits. She's wearing a little bit more clothing. Well, it's a, it's a uh, warm that, weather that, getaway that. edition, so we wanted to warm people up with our cover. I think we accomplished. Tell it. us about the magazine. We described it described it as lifestyles, trends, and interesting tidbits about men in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. How do you sum it up? Well, it's just a, a magazine for men's interests: golf, martinis, politics, cigars, business. You know, we just saw nothing on the landscape for men, and we decided to develop a publication. Not only a publication, but it's a it's a multimedia brand. As you look at the magazine, you see the little guy up uh, leaning against the fence post. We have a great website, JerseyManMagazine.com. We have what we think is an excellent magazine with some of the writers we'll talk about here in a second. We have a radio uh, programming in the works as well as a television show. So we want to present the man brand as Jersey Man and a multimedia concept to every advertiser. And we're well on our way to doing well, it. Well, actually, like that, it, and it's a great concept, by the way, because we all know about the, the Jersey women. They've had their own TV series and so right. forth. A lot of different spin-offs on those. TV series. Yeah. Don't hear too much about the Jersey Man, who's an interesting brand uh, in and of, its, of, it, of itself there. Do you, and the, the personalities that you do on this, do you try and reflect that in some of the personalities and the feature stories you tell? Yeah, we try to uh, put uh, people on the cover that we think people are interested in. We've had a, a wide array of people. You know, we had Merrill Reese on our first cover. George Anastasia, who is now a regular columnist for us, was a cover for us. Neil Cavuto of Fox News, who's a Jersey guy, lives in Mendham, New Jersey, actually had me on his show up at, at Fox. That was mm -hmm. a great experience for me. Of course, Michael Smirkanish and Michael Barkan and some of the great local people uh, have been featured in Jersey Men Magazine. And, and you know, it's funny, uh, when you publish a magazine, and you approach someone about being on the cover, you can get through to anybody. Sure. You know? I mean, I can we get. You want to I, put you on the cover of the yeah, magazine? Okay. I can get through to Governor Christie. I can, I can get through to the, the head of NBC News, whoever, because I guess people's egos say, "Hey, I want to be on the cover." By of the magazine. way, have you done Christie? I mean, he'd we're, be a we're, no we're, we're working on it. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, he's so hot right now. Oh, I mean, yeah. he may say, ah, "I don't have time to be bothered," mm -hmm. only because I'm going for Time Magazine. Right. You know, I may Maybe. be president one day. Um, but you found a niche, as you say, in mm -hmm. here because. It, People wanted to read about this stuff, um, and I, I, you know, as we thumb through it, we see that here's ads for roofing. You know, that's all man stuff. You know, you're talking about back pain and, you know, men complaining about yeah. their backs and so forth. And, 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 you know, men hanging out in the city. I see uh, uh, Jervis. Uh, Jervis, my, my Peterson. Man, Jer my, Jervis Peterson. Jervis Peterson. My man Jervis. Back. He writes From Survivor. A, yeah, he writes a, a regular column, an advice column for us in Jersey Man Magazine. Uh -huh, so Jervis uh -huh. is part of our uh, stable of writers. Uh huh. And and, and 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 oh look, by the way, there's a picture of Art Fennell and Rob Murray uh, in the magazine right. as well. But the point being that you know this is people in New Jersey out and about, mm -hmm. lifestyles, hanging out, and obviously people are interested in reading about this and taking a little something else with them that they didn't know perhaps. Yeah, and in, it's not only in Jersey, we have distribution in Philadelphia as well, and we feel like uh, companies in Philadelphia want to do business with, with people across the river, so uh, we're, you know, we're also developing a concept called Philly Man, which will be a spin-off of the magazine to, to have it neither greater influence uh, here, but we know we're on to a valid concept here. There is really nothing for men. 
Um, and we have a, an affluent demographic of males 35 and up with high incomes, which is attractive to advertisers. So, mm -hmm. and again, if you, you want to talk about our writers, one of the most flattering things to me as a publisher is having guys like uh, Sam, Sam Carcitti, who's the Flyers beat writer, who's a regular columnist in Jersey Man Magazine. Stan Hockman, maybe the preeminent uh, oh, yeah. sports reporter of all time in Philly, writes, uh, he likes to write food reviews for Jersey Man. So Stan Hockman writing food we reviews. We send him out to dinner and he writes food reviews. Views. Yeah, and he does a great job at it. Yeah, Robert Strauss of uh, the New York Times and S Sports Illustrated, regular contributor. Lisa Winkler of Smithsonian Magazine. By the way, I mentioned women. We have women writers. We do features on women. We've done a, a feature on a woman cigar aficionado. We've done a feature on a woman race car driver. I get more emails from women about Jersey men than I do from men. Maybe it's because they're more thoughtful and they take the time to write, but they do seem to like the magazine. Well, isn't that interesting, though? Because... When you think about it, it kind of makes sense that if you've got a magazine featuring prominent men in New Jersey and all the things they're doing and so forth, mm -hmm. that would attract interest from women, prominent mm -hmm. women and, and, and otherwise who, who may have something to offer or, mm -hmm. or, or, or whatever in terms of uh, for the magazine or mm -hmm. uh, just an interest and appeal for them. Well, there's a, you know, women love sports as well. That's what we found. And there's a lot of women Eagle fans out there. And I do a fair amount of uh, venting my frustration with writing some stories on the, the Eagles, and they respond to that. Uh, you know, and they, uh, they uh, dining, I mean, women are, love wine. We have a wine column by uh, Bob Kennedy, who does a, a great wine column for us. And, you know, uh, I know you, sh uh, my partners, Joe LaGrosa and Alex Kazmark, this would not have been possible without the support of my partner, so I wanted to recognize But By the way, and, and, and two things here, and I want to get to that, but you, you, you're a regular contributor to your own writer. You're the publisher, and right. so it makes sense that your voice be in here. No, I write. I write in every issue. I usually write the cover story. If not, I do a publisher's column and at least one or two stories in the magazine. Let's get back to what you just said about your supporters who've helped you along the way. Mm -hmm. Embarking on a journey like this is a far cry from driving that Chrysler Cordoba with the Corinthian leather right. when you were bouncing around from team to team and then trying to knock on doors to be a salesman and mm -hmm. so forth. But, but you were able to transition through forming partnerships, business relationships and so forth. Mm -hmm. Speak to me about your life and how all of that came about. Well, the same gut instinct that told me to try to play professional football without having played high school, I followed that, that, that same gut feeling here with the magazine. Uh, I saw nothing for men. Uh, I found some people who were interested in it. Now, we were advised against it because, you know, there's a perception that print is dying. Now, hard news may be dying. Hard newspapers may be dying. But there's still a, f uh, a future for feature magazines. The only place that you can get Jersey Man content is in Jersey Man magazine or on the Jersey Man web uh, website. And people want the content. So we, we followed uh, our gut, and uh, we're, we're two years running. Um, we're attracting major advertisers. Some of the biggest companies in the city and in Jersey are now with Jersey Men Magazine. They like what we're doing, and we hope to go forward in many media streams that we, as we talked about. Well, well, you know that it's working for you because you've been able to sustain it. And, and then again, I think it goes back into what you said earlier. Um, the people you've surrounded yourself and attached to the product. You mentioned some of the writers that you have. These are major personalities and major writers that, that bring something to the table. They're not Absolutely. just some old, by the way, um, you know, run of the mill people who have a pen and they can give you a voice, but th that's important, isn't well, it? Well, of course. I mean, George Anastasia is probably the preeminent mob author in the country and he does a regular column for us. And, you know, and we have some several young writers that do a great job for us too. And, uh, uh, it, 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 I really like the fact that we're able to help some of these young people get into the business. I have an associate, Chris Sanchez, that works with us, is doing a phenomenal job. So uh, uh, young let's, and old alike are jumping on the Jersey Let's Man show the like. video of the magazine again for people who may not be familiar with it. I just want them to I want to lock this in their heads. Jersey Man, um, prominently featured, and then and, and there with women uh, on the label there. It's on... It's on um, Places where people can find it? Find it at most Barnes & Nobles. You can also get a subscription for only $15 at jerseymanmagazine.com, or you can uh, send me an email, ken at jerseymanmagazine.com. We'll take care of you. Ken at Jersey Man. Mag
jerseymanmagazine.com and also the, the website jerseymanmagazine.com so people can go there, check it out. And again, this is the current edition. They're uh, <laughs> the swimsuit edition with the lady with all the clothes on. But uh, Which, by the this way, is the getaway. was a coincidence. <laughs> we, did, we knew nothing about the Sports <laughs> Illustrated cover and it came out at about the same time. So maybe they copied from us. So. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Well, it's a good publication and, uh, and it's a tribute to, um, to your work and your, and your um, tenacity and all this. Ken Dunnick, we want to thank you. Um, good luck to you and continued success in what you're doing. As you say, you found your place in the marketplace, and we're, we're all enjoying that. I appreciate so it. So we thank Great you. Great to be with you. All right. Thank you for being there as well. I'm Art Fennell. See you again next time on The Report.